Hello everyone, I am Demented Kirby, and welcome to my channel, The Commander Tavern. The Commander Tavern is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic the Gathering format. The Brewery is a series on this channel showcasing my spicy brews and other deck techs. On this episode of The Brewery, I will be discussing my take on Brea Ethereum Shaper. If you like this deck or any of the cards I'll be mentioning throughout the video, please consider using my TGG Player affiliate link when purchasing those cards. You can find a link to that down in the description. It'll really help out the channel. Other ways you can help support the channels with my Patreon. Patrons get early access to scheduled videos on YouTube and higher tier patrons get access to the VIP section of my Discord server as well. You can find a link to that down in the description too. In fact, patrons got a chance to see this video earlier. Alright, let's get back to the episode. Brea is a 4-4 artifact human costing 1 white, 1 blue, 1 black, and 1 red. Whenever she enters the battlefield, she creates 2 blue Thopter artifact creature tokens with flying. She also has a modular activated ability where you pay 2 mana and sacrifice 2 artifacts for the chosen effect. You can either deal 3 damage to a player, give a creature minus 4 minus 4, or gain 5 life. These are useful in their own respects since the second choice can deal with creatures and the third choice can save you from the brink of death. However, her first ability is a win con with enough mana and artifacts. The deck is capable of obtaining infinite amounts of both. Let's first see how we can secure that win and then how we can dig for it as well as how we're going to protect the combo. The deck's main infinite engine is Thopter Foundry and Sword of the Meek. Here's how the combo works. You sacrifice Sword of the Meek to Thopter Foundry, creating a 1-1 blue Thopter artifact creature. This triggers the sword, returning it to the battlefield. However, this requires mana to go infinite. Since the tokens created are artifact creatures, you can achieve infinite loops with Ashnet's Altar, Crack Clan Ironworks, and Phyrexian Altar. Of these, only Phyrexian Altar won't generate infinite mana during the loop. It only facilitates the loop going infinite. The previous two can generate infinite colorless mana with the loop. Let's see it with these to see how it would work. Let's say we have Ashnet's Altar in play. We sacrifice the Sword of the Meek to Thopter Foundry, creating a Thopter token. This triggers the sword, returning it to the battlefield. We now sacrifice the Thopter token to Ashnet's Altar, getting two colorless mana. We use one of those to start the loop all over again, netting one colorless mana each time. We can also achieve the same effect results with Quark Clan Ironworks. However, on its own, this loop doesn't do anything besides netting us infinite life. Although, if you add Anointed Procession, then you can get infinite Thopter tokens. However, when combined with Disciple of the Vault and or Perforous God of the Forge, we can kill the table right then and there. Every time we're sacrificing Sword of the Meek, Disciple of the Vault pings an opponent for one. Every time we create the Thopter token, Perforous pings the entire table for two. These two cards aren't the only ways to take advantage of this loop either. Either Flux Reservoir can take advantage of our infinite life to kill the table. What's great about all these pieces is that they work well separately too. The Altars can provide mana all while being a free sacrifice outlet. These two creatures can be used as a value engine even if you haven't reached infinity yet, and Aether Flux Reservoir could potentially take out an opponent as well as you gaining life. As for the infinite mana being generated, we can stick it into Urza Lord High Artificer. If we have no other win con, we could just cheat all of our spells with Urza until we find Disciple of the Vault, Perforos, or Aether Flux Reservoir. Not only that, but Urza can also be used to turn our artifacts into Mox Sapphires for some serious mana advantage, but we'll discuss our mana sources later on. If you have any colored mana remaining from any other sources, we can also use that infinite colorless mana to cast Exsanguinate or Death to the Deathless for X equals infinity. As with the other combo pieces or facilitators, these two spells are great on their own too, especially as mana sinks that can drain the entire table of ample amounts of life. Maybe not enough to kill off the entire table, but maybe enough to kill off an opponent or bring them to the brink of death. Assembling any variation of this combo is great and all, but is it reliable and consistent? Well, this is a 4 colored deck so it has all the tools needed to both dig for the combo as well as tutor for it. Vampiric Tutor and Enlightened Tutor are instant speed ways of top decking our combo pieces at the end of the turn before ours. Vampiric Tutor can tutor for any card but Enlightened Tutor isn't that far behind so it can tutor for either Thopter Foundry, Sword of the Meek, any of the Altars, either Flux Reservoir and even Perforos since he's an enchantment. Demonic Tutor is ubiquitous so it's pretty obvious how powerful it is for assembling combos especially in a deck like this one. Tribute Mage and Tesseret the Seeker are more flavorful ways of tutoring for our combo pieces. Tribute Mage can tutor for either Thopter Foundry or Sword of the Meek. He could also tutor for 3 of the mana rocks in the deck but we'll see those later. Tesseret the Seeker can cheat any artifact from our library onto the battlefield as long as he has the loyalty counters for it. Since he starts at 4, he can tutor both pieces as long as he survives 2 straight turns. He can also cheat in any of the altars and still stick around. You can also use him to cheat in Aether Flux Reservoir but keep in mind that it requires 4 loyalty to do so. He can also be used to ramp, especially since cheating in any of the zero-costed mana rocks and artifact lands doesn't cost him loyalty to do so, but again we'll see those later on. 
He can also dig through the deck with X costed draw spells. Blue Sun Zenith and Stroke of Genius can draw us X cards, but the way they're worded means that we can also sink that infinite mana into them to deck an opponent if we don't have on hand any of the previously mentioned win cons. So they do serve two functions in the deck, to draw and to win. Pull from tomorrow as Sphinx's Revelation may just be used for drawing X cards at instant speed, but at least Sphinx's Revelation can also give you X life, which can then also be used to power Aetherflux Reservoir to potentially take out an opponent from the game. We can also draw a ton of cards if we have value engine set up thanks to Skull Clamp. Equipping this to a 1 toughness token has us drawing 2 cards each time. Every creature token created in the deck is a 1 1, so it's definitely a great card draw effect. We can also draw into our deck with Riddlesmith, Vidalkin Archmage, and Psy Master Thopterist. Every time we cast an artifact, which the deck has plenty of, we draw a card off of Riddlesmith and Vidalkin Archmage. We do have to discard one away with Riddlesmith, but at least it's a you may ability. Psy creates a Thopter when we cast an artifact spell, but at least we can pay 2 and sacrifice 2 artifacts to draw a card. This may not be as efficient as the former 2 creatures, but Psy does provide free tokens so he can be a value engine on his own. Ristic Study is another way to draw cards as spells being cast, but it's from spells opponents cast. Whenever they don't pay the 1, we draw a card. We can also draw into a bunch of cards with Wheel of Fortune, Windfall, and Whispering Madness. Not only can these wheels fill up our hand, but it can also disrupt opponents by having them discard their hand. Sure, everyone is drawing, but we'll also be filling up our hand with acceleration and disruption. Speaking of disruption, how are we going to protect our combos and value engines? Well, even if we do manage to lose one of our combo pieces, we can recover them with Emery Lurker of the Lock or Hannah Ship's Navigator. Emery self mills us for when entering the battlefield, so that does provide a sense of acceleration as well. For just tapping her, we can cast any artifact from our graveyard. With Hannah, we have to pay 3 mana as well as tapping her. However, we can also recover an enchantment with her as well. That being said, we are able to protect our combos. Counter magic is one way. The decks running Pact of Negation, Force of Will, Force of Negation, Swan Song, Negate, Counterspell, Mana Drain, and Dobbin's Veto. Keep in mind that Force of Negation can't be cast for free during your own turn. So unless you're going to hard cast it, it's better used to disrupt opponents more so than protecting our combo. We can also protect our combos with spells like Teferi's Protection and Boros Charm. Teferi's Protection essentially phases us out, so unless it's an effect that literally says we lose the game, or an opponent winning the game, we're safe as well. It even protects our tokens. Boros Charm gives Indestructible to all of our permanents at instant speed, so it's also great against mass artifact hate. On the topic of Indestructibility, Darksteel Forge gives Indestructible to all of our artifacts. Having this out before assembling our combo makes it very difficult for our opponents to interact with it. Same goes for Tipadim, Council of Innovation. Giving Hexproof to all of our artifacts makes it very difficult to snipe our combo pieces with effects like Naturalize, Disenchant, and other similar spells. We can even extend this protection to all of our permanents thanks to Microsoft Lantis. This makes all permanents on the board become artifacts, so it also makes opponents think twice about casting that mass artifact destruction spell. It also makes all mana become any color we want, which is great with our infinite colorless mana combo from earlier. We can take further advantage of this effect with Karn the Great Creator. Having this combo in play pretty much results in opponents scooping. So it's another win con in the deck. Karn is still great since he can animate an artifact. We can't use his final ability in commander games, but with what we can do is enough warrant for inclusion in the deck. Speaking of mass hate, the deck also runs Austere Command, Cyclonic Rift, and Rebuild. Austere Command can also be used to destroy all annoying artifacts that can spell doom for this deck, such as Rest in Peace, Leyland of the Void, etc. Without our graveyard, we can use our main infinite combo. An overloaded Cyclonic Rift can also get rid of these, as well as absolutely any other non-land permanent on the board we don't control. The salt is always real with Cyclonic Rift. As for Rebuild, this will bounce everyone's artifacts back to their hand, which will also slow down opponents, especially those using mana rocks to speed up their game. It might seem like it slows us down, but keep in mind that the deck benefits from casting artifact spells so it can also be used proactively for value. Now we already saw some of the value engines from casting artifacts like Riddlesmith, Vidalkin, Archmage, and Psy. However, Psy isn't the only way to create tokens with value. Sahili Sublime Artificer creates a servo token whenever we cast a non-creature spell, so that counts instants, sorceries, enchantments, and planeswalkers too. We can also use Mirrodin Besiege to create artifact tokens if we choose the Mirrodin mode. While this can be very useful, depending on the circumstances, we can use the Phyrexian mode to win the game. If we have 15 or more artifacts in our graveyard during our upkeep, we can destroy an opponent. Oh, and we also loot doing our upkeep with this mode. The Dokken Ori and Leyland of Anticipation are other ways to improve our value engines. Giving flash to all of our spells means that we can keep mana open for our responses and play our permanents or other spells at the end of the turn before ours. We can also use them to flash in spells in order to trigger our engines. Casting artifacts with flash can trigger cards like the Dokken Archmage in order to draw cards, since they're incredibly useful in the deck. 
The Duncan Ori is also an artifact which is relevant and Leyland of Anticipation is free if it's in our opening hand. Speaking of our Lakar draw, Reliquary Tower and Thought Vessel are also included in the deck. This way we can keep all the cards if we dug too deep into our deck. This keeps our hands full of responses to ensure we win any counterspell war. Besides Thought Vessel, the other mana rocks in the deck are Mox Diamond, Mox Opal, Mox Amber, Mana Crypt, Mana Vault, Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, and Felwar Stone. Chrome Mox is omitted from this build because of how many artifacts the deck has. That way we don't risk not having anything to imprint on it. As mentioned earlier, the deck is running all 5 artifact lands. Unfortunately, these aren't spells so they won't trigger effects that care about casting artifacts. That being said, they can be used as sacrifice fodder as well as being fetchable with Tesseret the Seeker for free. Smothering Tithe and Storm the Vault help in creating treasure tokens. Not only are these tokens basically just Lotus Petals, but they're artifacts meaning that we can also use them as sacrifice fodder for our effects. Cracking them also triggers Disciple of the Vault too, so they're just great in the deck. Oh, and when Storm of the Vault transforms into Vault of Katlakan, it's an improved Tolarian Academy. The amount of blue mana this produces in the deck is insane, especially if we have Microsith Lattice in play. Well, in that case, it wouldn't just be blue mana if the Lattice is in play. The rest of the deck's mana sources are the rest of its lands. The deck's running all 11 fetch lands, all 6 shock lands, all 6 dual lands, Croesus's Catacombs, Joe Mars Cavern, Command Tower, Spire of Industry, and one of each basic snow land in case our opponents are running anything that benefits us for it. Either way, it's always good to run basics, not just for fetch lands, but because Blood Wound is a thing. This brew is just an idea of how to build around Brea Ethereum Shaper. Although this deck has some oppressive interactions and infinite combos, it's not a CDH build. It's a 7 at worst and an 8 at best. It can definitely be more fine-tuned and made more brutal to push it up to a 9, but it remains to be seen if Brea can reach a 10, especially considering that the top CEDH decks are just variations of Sushi Hulk or anti-Sushi Hulk decks. That being said, it's still a fun deck to pilot since it's not so linear even though it has some tutors and a lot of card draw. If you're interested in the decklist of this spicy brew of mine, you can find a link to it down in the description. I would like to thank all my patrons for supporting me and a quick shout out to all my higher tier patrons, the Brewers, for their patronage. I'd also like to thank anyone using my TCG Player affiliate link. That also helps out the channel. And to everyone, thanks for watching this episode of the Brewery on the Commander Tavern. I am Demented Kirby and happy brewing.